hey, sex. All right, so that's uh, that's kind of where we're headed right now in First Corinthians. We're talking about sex. Well, we're talking about sexual immorality. We're talking about misuse of sex. And I don't think it's a coincidence that following the discussion on sexual immorality that that Paul puts forth, St. Paul puts forth, he talks about marriage in chapter 7. So uh, let's take a look at this. We're going to talk a little bit of, about sexual immorality, then we'll go back and look at the passage, various parts of it. Uh, there's at least one term that might be uh, confusing here that I'll go back and explain. But yeah, we'll take a look at this. Then I'm going to go on and I'm going to talk about 2,000 years later, different ways that this may have been approached. Not may, no. Uh, it's definitely been approached very, very badly. A lot of it has been done with authoritarianism rather than love, and that's that's the biggest mistake. That when you start when you start coming down on people like we, with your authority, when you start saying, okay, when you start making yourself into the purity police, when you start deciding that along with the position of being church sheriff, your has your pastor has become the pants patrol or something like that. Things can get weird and bad, and they have gotten weird and bad. So I'll talk about that weird and bad a little bit and how I think we we should approach this, this important topic of sexual immorality. I'll talk about how I believe this applies to Christians and how we see it in society today because sexual immorality is a thing. It's sex is a sensitive subject and with that there are some aspects of morality. Not morality just in the sense of some some sort of religious finger shaking sort of thing but even in the news today we've seen that that there has been a lot of cases where people have been sexually bullied, whether it's har harassment or outright assault. There are there are moral issues when it comes to to sex and. It's something that we need to be able to to talk about. Christians need to be able to talk about this. And it seems like there have been many times, many places where talking about sex and sexual immorality were kind of taboo subjects, even though it's it's addressed in the Bible. So let's give this a read. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Yeah, 12 through 20. And here we go. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach for food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the member of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Never. I do not know. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? 
For it is said, the two will become one. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Okay, it's an interesting passage for this day and age. So many people would say that this is old fashioned, that this sort of thing is, is something of the past. It's a relic. It doesn't account for uh, this modern day and age, but I disagree. I think that for Christians, it is actually good to wait for a marriage relationship. Now, keep in mind that there are times where Christians find themselves in places where the aspects of finding a romantic relationship, they're not that good. I mean, we do have things like the internet and there are safe ways to use the internet. Internet safety might be something I need to talk, talk about on a vlog sometime, but yeah, there are are ways to to meet good people online and if you are talking to a stranger online find some friends that you can talk to about this process and you know if you want to meet the stranger meet them in a group you know Christians can actually invite the stranger to their church let friends know hey this person I talked to online is coming to see me why don't we meet this person together so if you do have a community, a Christian community that meets and fellowships on Sunday, that could be a good place to invite them to. Now, as, as I said, I'm going to go back to this passage and starting from the beginning, I'm going to, to read it again and stop every now and then to try to explain a few things. Everything is permissible for me but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. I like that Paul repeats that twice. He's pointing out that grace is something we have. We can misuse it. We can, we can do anything we want. We have freedom. However, that doesn't, just because we can do everything we want doesn't mean we should do everything we want. Because we have this relationship with Christ, there is a responsibility there. The, the classic Spider-Man line is, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, when you have this kind of freedom to do anything you want because your sins have been forgiven, that kind of freedom can be used really, really badly. In fact, some people in the Church of Corinth were saying, uh, this next saying, for the stomach, for the stomach, food for the stomach, and the stomach for food. As in, hey, you know, that's what my stomach's for. Hey, I have these desires. This is, must be what my body's for. That's kind of the idea of this saying, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Paul goes on to say, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and will, he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then make the member of Christ unite with a prostitute? Never. Do not 
Do you not know he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? Now, I think that's something that's very, very important, showing that there is an actual bond that happens during sex. There is a spiritual bond that Christians should be very sensitive to. And it's it's something important to remember remember that even though we may like it saying very flippantly it was just sex might not exactly be the full picture here. That being said, it's not the end of the picture either. I read an article that had a statistic saying that in America about 80% of evangelical Christians have sex before marriage. 80%, that's, that's quite the number. Now, there are also Christians all over the world, they're having sex before marriage. Some feel guilty about it. Some don't feel guilty about it. Some figure, hey, this is just a normal modern relationship. Others feel that they, they feel a tug on their heart saying it's like, oh, maybe we should have waited. I think that waiting can be good. Remembering how important sex is, is something for Christians to be considering. Because you have this bond. You have this spiritual bond with God already, and now you are sharing this bond that God intended for marriage. For it is said, two will become one in will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins are committed outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Very, very powerful words, very strong words from St. Paul. I waited for marriage. I'm very fortunate in that case. But I know many people who don't, many people who haven't. Some regret, some don't. Some figure this was something that was going to happen before we were married. This is typical in our society. And I think in love, brothers and sisters of Christ have to work with all of those aspects and points of view. I think it's clear that abstinence for Christians, it's, it's a good thing. But there's also the suggestion that apparently the community could handle it. And that's something that's, that leaders, people in leadership have to realize. Can our fellowship actually handle relationships? Are we there for the needs of the single hearts? Are we there for the needs of the married hearts? They're, they both exist in Christian communities. How does God meet them? And if we're basically saying to singles, all right, stay pure, good luck, and 
that's the beginning and end of it. You know, make good choices. Um, then how are we really meeting that need? You know, how are we even considering what variety of feelings that they may be experiencing? In fact, this might be a good way that that married people and single people can interact. Maybe married people can help look at the single people because they have their experience and because they have their, their experience as singles and experience as being married. Maybe singles can help look after the married people because when you're married, especially with a family, those married people could use a bit of help. So in a Christian community, there should be some sincere sharing in these responsibilities. Now, I've mentioned that while I believe abstinence is, is great, that historically bad directions have gone with this, ha ha have happened because of this. And some as ridiculous as the chastity belt, um, various weird contraptions for boys. It seems like the industrial age was a weird place for um, people trying to creatively get rid of male desires. It was very, very strange. Kellogg's apparently one of the reasons why they were pushing cornflakes was because they wanted to try to, they believed that cornflakes helped to quell sexual desires in men. There, and of course you have various forced abstinences of priesthoods and monks and nuns taking vows of celibacy when really there sh probably should be marriage allowed. <laughs> Not probably, I'll outright say it. They're, they should allow marriage. Priests, nuns, monks should be allowed to marry. Some cultures that make sense, some that sound strange. I think that I know it should be allowed because of what we're going to read in chapter 7 for the next one. But yeah, when these subjects are brought to our attention without love, then they become very, very unhelpful and sometimes outright destructive. Now, we can't say sexual immorality just doesn't exist. There are so many people who have been bullied into, into sexualized relationships, not sex itself, but sexual harassment for men and women, towards men and women, is a thing that happens. In the media we've been seeing recently how people in power in the entertainment industry, people in power in politics have been misusing their power to try to, for the sake of very, very selfish sexual gratification. So we know sex being an intimate, important thing is something that needs to be approached with maturity, with, with care and love. And if you know somebody, or if you are somebody who has been sexually harassed, sexually abused, and you've been, been hiding it, look for somebody to talk to. Try to find somebody 
that you can trust somebody who is mature and say, hey, this happened to me. I, I really need to talk about it. Because as we see, sex is a sensitive thing. It's something that needs to be, be cherished. And in Christian circles, I think it needs to be looked after and protected. Now, Christ, now, Christians are going to make their own decisions. Every individual is going to make their own decisions on how they approach this passage. I'm glad I made the choice that I did. I'm not going to look down on anybody who makes a different choice. I'm going to encourage my son to make good choices. And I encourage my friends to make good choices too. But understand that you are dealing with something very beautiful, very intimate. And it's not something to be misused or necessarily used in a way that's that's selfish. So do talk about sex. Do talk about abstinence. Do make it a consideration. I and when I say consideration People come down hard on me because I'm not, they tell me I'm not coming down hard enough. But I'm not, I'm not patrolling your pants. I'm not, I don't think that's the place of a priest. I think that, that pastors, priests, Christian leaders, I think that we need to come here and say, hey, look, God's telling us this because he loves us. God is showing us this because he wants good things for us. And it's if it's simply about authoritarian shaming, which it often has been in the past, then I don't think that it's going to be very helpful to any of us. I don't think that that me running around yelling purity, purity, purity is going to help you. I don't think it's going to help people I minister to here in Romania. I want people to pursue purity. I want that. But I'm not your police. I'm not your policeman. I'm not, I'm not a I'm not trying to put together a morality squad. I want a fellowship in church. I want people to feel free to wait for marriage. I want people to feel free to make good choices. I want people to experience a freedom where people can say, you know what, because of what I'm seeing here, I'm going to try to to live more biblically. Now, one of the things Paul says in the next chapter, spoiler alert, uh, he points out that those who have who are burning in passion should marry. It's like, okay, okay, well that's uh, it's a big step for a lot of people. It's like we just went from sex to marriage. But if you if you are a Christian and purity is important to you, and I think it should be from what we read here, then you um, since the majority of us we have desires, we need to consider marriage a possibility. 
And for that, we may want to have a better understanding of relationships in general, having mutual respect for each other, and looking out for our brothers and sisters in the community. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to overstep your bounds and become a matchmaker. But if it's a completely innocent thing and you see a good match, it couldn't hurt to ask. It couldn't hurt to say, hey, what about you and you? I don't think that's too nosy. But, you know, this we're also in a day and age where church, you may not know anyone in your church. You may come in, sit down, get up, and leave. And it's a good question to ask if if that point at that point this place is being church to you or if you are being church to this place. It's a fair question. It could be a hard question, but it's a fair one. Now, I also don't think that this is a place for necessarily people overstepping their bounds to the point where they decide that they have to become the church's matchmaker, but hopefully good relationships are happening in your community. Hopefully, if you have a building, if you have a Sunday service, hopefully the people in your church are people you want to be around. <laughs> and hopefully if you're you're one of the many fortunate ones that this actually works out for you know maybe you'll actually meet that special someone in the walls of an institutional church that meets on Sunday hey that's great I'm glad that worked out for you but we also have to realize that there is a whole lot of people with a whole lot of different situations God loves them. God wants to meet with them wherever they're at, single or married. Whatever our, whatever struggles we have, whether we're sinning, whether we're sinning, whether we're getting something right, <laughs> what wherever we're at, God wants to meet us with love, care, and compassion caring and compassion. We can't look at people who who do one kind of sin and say, nope, nope, you're banned. You know, that doesn't work. It doesn't work for community and it does, doesn't work particularly for the repentant. There are occasions where unrepentant sin leads us to a point where the body can't help that person anymore. In those cases, it seems, as we've seen in previous chapters, and I think later chapters as well, Paul says, I give that person over to Satan. And that's something very important about unrepentant sin. You know, it's it's not a question of how God, how can I repent from this? What steps do I need to take now that I have done this? How can we figure this out? And in the last video, we talked about Christians having good judgment. And in that judgment, there has to be love. There has to be the kind of love that Christ talks about in his story of the prodigal son, where the son went out, made a mess of everything, came back to his father, and his father was so happy to see him again, to see him back, he threw a party for him. God has that kind of love for us when we when we turn our backs on him, he welcomes us back in. And as a church, we need to be 
very, very welcoming. That doesn't mean we put our brains aside and say, look, let's make the guy who was stealing from church the church accountant or something like that, you know. It doesn't mean that we we aren't wise with each other. One way that I've seen that lack of wisdom work out is when um, a powerful ex megachurch pastor came back and some people were suspicious of him. He, he started a church in a different state and people were reasonably suspi suspicious because of a lot of scandals. Somebody who was highly a big fan of his, despite all scandals, uh, another pastor very, very quick was quick to say, what? He said he's sorry. We can all say we're sorry. You know, what's he? What has he done to show that he's sorry? I think that there has to be more than a, whoops, my bad. I'm so, I, I did that. Well, let's move on. No, it's, if actual hurt was caused, there has to be talk about, you know, how we move past that hurt. How we restore something, if it can be restored. Now here, in the case of sexual immorality, it talks about the two becoming one in flesh. Well, I mean, what's done is done there. And that's not permission to go sleep with prostitutes. No, no, that's not what that is. But it is consideration that we've all sinned and we come short of the glory of God. My sins are different from your sins. Your sins are different from my sins. And I'm very, very thankful that God's forgiving me for all that I've done wrong. Now, that's a forgiveness that that Christians are wonderful participants in. We're not too far gone. That's I, I once had a friend, a colleague in a bookstore that I worked with, worked in, say that if she if she if she stepped into a church, she would spontaneously combust. She would just explode because she was so simple. If that was true, there would be no church buildings in existence right now. There would just be giant craters in the ground, you know, because. Christ came for sinners. He came for sinners like me. He came for sinners like all of us. And I think for too long, people have taken the love out of this passage. But really, what this passage should be is a refocus of our love. And I think that's what Paul is trying to do with it. I think he's trying to, to, to kind of encourage people to pull away from lust and move the direction of love. And the particular love that I think he may be talking about for couples is marriage. So the next video will be about marriage. I hope you enjoyed that one. I hope you enjoyed this one. There's a lot to think about in this short passage, uh, a lot that has not been talked about enough, I think. I think that Christians should be able to have mature discussions about sex, about Christian perspectives on sexual immorality, on what the world sees as sexual immorality, and what the Bible sees as sexual immorality, because it does exist in the world. There, there, 
are Christians do not have the uh, Christians do not have the only morality. They have biblical morality. They have a worldview. They have a relationship with God that helps shape moral opinions that they have, which I think is I'm very thankful for. I'm very thankful that that I've been blessed to make a variety of good choices. I pray that in the future I can make I can make more good choices. Um, and I'm thankful that I'm forgiven for the bad choices I've made. But yeah, there's a lot to consider relationally about sexual immorality. And if you find yourself in a place where you feel ashamed um, for any variety of reasons, there, try to find safe people that you can talk to about your feelings. Maybe a man or a woman in church, preferably one that you know is safe, uh, maybe a safe person, a counselor, maybe church leadership, maybe not church leadership. Let's let's be clear on that. I I would love it if I could just say you know everybody who becomes a church leader is mature and can handle what you throw at them. They're human. Some of them have been so have been so much have looked at the the word of the law so much that they forget the spirit of the law and they purposely or accidentally end up putting God's love aside. If you don't know the kind of love that your Christian leader has, I, I would honestly say that you may be safer not talking to them because you don't know. Try to go to where the love is, particularly loving Christians in your church, that you could say, hey, this is going on. What do I do? But be wise about it, you know? I mean, ask around, you know, maybe it's like, even casually, not mentioning yourself in the situation, maybe say, how do you think, what do you think he would do if somebody approached him with this problem? You know, just throwing that out there. I recommend that kind of caution biblically, actually. I recommend that because Christ tells us to not put our pearls before swine. If you take what's precious before you and put it out in front of somebody who's not going to be appreciative of it, you could get hurt. So be careful when you're talking about something this intimate. God wants us to be careful with this intimacy in general. So be careful who you talk to about this intimacy. I think Christians should be able to, to talk about it. I do. But I think that that's historically so many of us have dropped the ball that we can't be foolish in regards to who we discuss intimate issues with. And those are my thoughts on this passage. I'm going to call it a night. I, I hope some of them may have been helpful. And in the next one, I might record tomorrow, maybe. Um, I'll be talking about marriage, which I find to be wonderful. I, I'm, I'm very blessed to have a wonderful wife here in Romania. And we'll be, I look forward to 
looking at some of Paul's perspective on marriage. One pastor said that he believes that Paul might have had a wife at some time in his history. I don't know. We don't see anything in the Bible about that, but it could be why he, it could be one of the reasons why he has so many thoughts about marriage. He could have so many thoughts about marriage because Paul, St. Paul just apparently has a lot of wisdom and a lot of thoughts. We'll see though. That's a, uh, that's for next time in chapter seven of first Corinthians. And Bara vedere, ciao, papa. Other ways to say goodbye. But uh, feel free to say hello with a like of this video or comment in the comment se section or contact me about anything you see in any of my videos. Bye bye.